outside work as well lately. Like, uh, uh, yeah. You're literally a teacher. Yes. High school, middle school, do you not want to say? Uh, middle school. Mi- oh, middle school, yeah. geez. Is that just the worst job? I'm so sorry. I just. It's challenging. It, it's I, challenging. it has I, to I, be. I will, I will grant you that. My mom you taught know, I, fifth grade. And Ooh, that's rough. Yeah. So her big thing, her big thing was um, like kids coming to school and parents at home just do nothing for their kids anymore. And like we think, so I was talking about this on Twitter just earlier. We think that like, um, like a lack of faithful catechism at home is like, oh, this is a Lutheran problem. But like the truth is no parents are doing, even secular parents aren't really doing anything. My mom has so many stories that, that like, uh, a girl in her class starts her period for the first time in the middle of the school day and is freaking out because she has no idea what's going on because her parents never told her that this is a thing that happens. Right. And now my mom, the teacher has to like manage this situation. And it, and it, it just, I can't imagine being a teacher. I may be like a college professor where people have something figured out, but. And that, yeah, that's kind of a different, situation there but yeah with there is a degree of sort of you know fire and forget parenting where they yeah. you know people send their kids to the school and people have this idea in their heads of, oh this is what pe- what we did at school when i was in school and that must be the way things are now so everything's fine it's like, yeah you know and it's, it's yeah. that's sometimes the case with, with with respect to some things but with respect to others not quite so much well and not to not to like bag on overworked parents. I know they exist. Um, I know there are a lot of parents out there that are doing everything they can, but like how many parents dread the summer um, and love the school year because like, Oh great. Here's a place where I can send this little monster for eight hours a day and not have to worry about it. You know? Yeah. That's a question I think is just best left unpondered for my sake. Perfect. Perfect. (laughs) So outside of teaching, um, um, what do you do other than other than refusing to repent of your Anglicanism? <laughs> what, what do you do with your time? What do I do with my time? I mean, I, you know, I, I spend too much time on the Bird website, as you well okay. know. Uh, yep. Good good amount of reading. I'm in church normally twice a week. Oh, uh, wow. at, you know. At least once a week. Yeah, so we, we, we have like a Wednesday evening prayer service, which is not as well attended as, as I would like, but it's better than just not having, having that opportunity at all. Nice, yeah. Yeah, Joe's lucky to get me in a pew twice a month. That's a joke. <laughs> that's, a, that's a joke, everybody. I go to church. One um, would hope. One would hope. <laughs> one would hope. Um Church, church is, uh, it's like reading the Bible. It's one of those optional things. <laughs> eh, you know, just, just get, get, get to it when you can. When you, you know, not that important. If you feel like you have time for it. So, um, why, why are you an Anglican? I knew this question was going to come up. Of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so, um, I know like in my case, so I was raised Methodist. Uh, okay, and I, I know you, you've, you've had a, a couple other people on on, on, on your podcast who have, have, have a similar background, and so I, you know, I, I was raised in I guess what I would characterize as a fairly conventional, maybe more liturgically oriented Methodist church. I, mean, I think, as as you know, the United Methodist Church is pretty. It's a well, and they're fracturing now, but it has historically been a pretty large tent. So yeah. you'll you'll find a lot of a lot of diff, a lot of diff, different kinds of people in it, and the, the church we went to growing up was maybe somewhere in the middle. Um, And, you know, we, you know, we, we went to church on Sunday. I wasn't big into the youth group stuff because whether dispositionally or whatnot, I I just didn't particularly care for it. And I guess what, like kind of when I got to college, I just sort of stopped going because when you're in college, it's it's, it's an easy thing to not do, especially if you're going to like a, like a secular public school and there's not like specific impetus to do it. I mean, you know, people who go to like certain, Christian college, like there's like a, there's like a weekly chapel service or something. Not the case at all. So it, it it became a kind of like you know Easter only or Easter plus whenever you feel like it, which turns into almost never. 
uh, which is, you know, not the best place to be in. And I guess maybe about half, maybe not quite, half, quite half, halfway through college, but um, what about my sophomore year of college? I, I learned about this thing called eliminated materialism, okay. which is this it's, 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 it's this idea in philosophy that basically the human mind is entirely just it's, it's this basic idea that all, all there is to humanity is that you know, we're, we're basically you sort of walking meat batteries. And that, you know, everything that we do and think and feel is basically, okay, there's, there's your neurotransmitters and other stuff that goes on in your brain. And I went, wow, that's really depressing. Yeah. That's just yeah, yeah. a really, really, and, th- and there are very intelligent people who believe this. And there are, there are people who write like, uh, write like, or, like articles. Wait, the, and I went, so hang on. I'm not very smart. So we're yeah, going yeah. to have to, we're going to have to back this up a bit for me. Okay. <laughs> this is like anti-Gnosticism where we're sort like, of, yeah. So like where like the Gnostics would say that like the spiritual is the only important thing. This is almost like a straight materialist. You're just a bunch yes. of worthless neurons firing around. That's ex- yeah, yeah. It's the opposite. Yeah, it's, it's the opposite of sort of, you know, Neoplatonist idea. Oh, well, what really matters is this immaterial realm that we can we can access imperfectly at all. If it, it, like, yeah, yeah, this is, the, this is going the other direction, which is the only thing there is, is sort of the, the physical atoms and whatnot. And it also is worthless. <laughs> That I and, and that and that's kind of the conclusion that you that, that you read. Well, it has to oh, be. Wow, this is. I mean, I think so, but like, so there's no, you can. I don't. I don't see there. I I know plenty of atheists that say, the oh, well, if you need some magic book to give you meaning to your life, and it's like, no, bro, you don't get it. Without the magic book, your life doesn't have meaning. Like, if you really think that you're just here, uh, a speck of cosmic space dust for a, a limited time and then you're gone forever like your life has no meaning bro yeah and so like it was kind of that point i said okay well that's not like a view of the world that i think i want to adopt <laughs> as it is you know Solid. You know, yeah you know it's, 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 it's a life choice i guess so i started going back to church and of course when i decided to go back to church i you know i defaulted to the methodist church in, in my in my college town because that was you know i was I grew up as a Methodist. That was kind of what I was used to. And was sort of in dealing with like, the, you know, the college ministry and with church in that town, you know, nice, lovely people, but it was all oriented towards, it was always Jesus and something else. It was always, Oh, Jesus and the environment or this other external thing that whatever, you know, what, whatever importance it has, we, it, no one was really asking questions about scripture or what church teaching properly understood actually is. And so that that so that just grew very frustrating, kind of kind of, kind of navigating through that. And so I, it was it would have been like about halfway through college. I ended up, I remember I was walking through like the campus center or whatnot, and there was a flyer up for an organization called Reform University Fellowships. So there, so they are the uh, ministry arm for, for the Presbyterian Church in America, and they were advertising, "Oh, we're we're doing this sermon series on Philippians." I was like, "Huh." So we're we're, we're actually doing Bible stuff now, huh? Like that, that, that actually sounds appealing as, as, you know, as, as compared against, you know, what, what I've been doing earlier. Um, so, and so, and, and so, so like, you know, I, I, I was doing, you know, I, I did, you know, our, our, you know, our, our UF large group meetings for, for a couple years in college. And I, I, I was associated or a member of the PCA for about a total of five years, uh, just basically from Taylor to college through, through grad school and through my first job. And you know, there's all the you know, and there's like a lot of like important valuable things that I learned with that, that experience, um, but I, I kind of started growing dissatisfied with it for like, for like a couple of reasons. One was that I think as a lot of people who have been in sort of you know reform or reform adjacent circles can attest, there's a there's a lot of obsession with and again this 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 may be an, a peculiarly American thing or particularly certain kinds of Presbyterians. But there's a certain obsession with certain types of theology as expressed in the 19th century without much willingness to go much further back than that. Like, we're vaguely mm. aware there's this guy called Luther who existed, and there was this guy called Calvin who we might read. But anything in that time space between or anything like before the Reformation, I mean, maybe we'll give some lift service to Augustine here and there. But there just, but there, but there just wasn't a lot of interest, at least from my perspective. And, you know, what is the historical thrust of church teaching and the development of the church? That was kind of one frustration that I had. Right. Uh, the, other, the, 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 the other component to that is you know, this was also pure when I was like, I, I, I was curious about Roman Catholicism. 
because like something obviously that you know exists. I'm like, okay, there, I know there's some stuff they believe that I think is a little weird. And I know that they know the Bible exists. Like, I know, you know, we, we make jokes about Catholics not knowing their Bible, which is a little right. unfair, I think. Yeah. But it's like, OK, OK, like there, there's got to be an argument here. Like they're like these people aren't stupid. Right. right. And so like I and so like I did some some investigation of that. I'm going, I went, I mean, there's a lot of stuff here that I don't agree with. But they got some points on a couple of issues. Hmm. And it's you know, it's possible that maybe some aspects of, of the Reformation as it went forward maybe did throw throw the baby out with the bathwater on a couple of things. And so I you know, I kind of thought to myself, you know, if I had to do it over again, I might go the Anglican route because there, there there's a very there's, it's a tradition that's more serious on on, on sacramentology, it's more serious on its adherence to holy orders and, and and a few other things. And so that was kind of how I kind of got my start into it. Because uh, when 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 I, when I ended up you know, like, you know a couple of moves later I, you know I ended up finding a small Anglican pair that 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 sort of fit the bill for me. So, a, a couple of thoughts that I just kind of want to throw in there. Okay. Um, I so you you had mentioned like you were sort of curious about Catholicism and you thought like. I know they're a little weird, but maybe I should check it out. You know, at least kind of like poke, poke around because they're not stupid. And it's funny because like, I don't know if this is your experience, but my experience is that Catholics are a little weird. Um, they're just the things that I thought as a general normie prot going to Catholicism, the things that I thought were weird, like five, 10 years ago about Catholicism, I actually don't think are weird about Catholicism now. I think they're, they're like spot on. And the things that I now think are weird about Catholicism, I didn't even know existed like 10 years ago. Does that make sense? Like, Sort of, I think. I'm not entirely sure what you're referring to. Okay, but. so like I thought like, okay, so Catholics are weird because they believe it's really the body and blood of Christ. Fast forward 10 years and I'm like, I'm okay, like, yeah. wow, it really is the body and blood of Christ. But Catholics are still weird because of like, I don't know, like Marian doctrines or whatever. Like, yeah. there's, you know, like yeah. they're still weird, but it's, it's like different, like different reasons now. Right, because, you know, the... The more you learn, the more questions you ask, the more the more questions you answer. You know the the, the you know the different you, the model of information you're working with becomes. I will say, I will say, probably one of the most influential Catholic theologians in my life is my buddy David's grandfather, and I have had one conversation with this man in my whole life, and I only remember one thing from this conversation, but. It has given me a perspective on Roman Catholicism that I think has been very beneficial for me. He said, if you want to study biology, you ask a biologist. If you want to learn about history, you ask a historian. And if you want to learn about Christianity, you ask a Roman Catholic because we've been doing it for 2,000 years. And I thought, that's actually... It's, you know, I, I disagree with the Roman Catholicism has existed since the inception of Christianity. Obviously, I think it was Lutheranism, but I digress. Um, but still, the the point was well made. Sure. You yeah. know, that you're right. They're not they're not stupid. Right. They're there right. are intelligent people that think very deeply about these things. On really all sides, and I'm very unfair to Anglicans, and I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, know, you you may have noticed I just don't react whenever you start Anglican posting. I just like, yeah. okay, this is, <laughs> like, this is just this, this this is just Remy being Remy. I'm just gonna let him do his thing. <laughs> it's like you know me so well, um, and I will say I I whether or not you're taking me up on my offer to be your sworn enemy. You said you needed you needed. <laughs> one so i'm i'm taking you up on it whether you i i vaguely remember saying this at some point i hope i hope we can have one of those um one of those rivalries where uh 
it's like uh, if someone else comes in to dump on me or if someone comes in to like attack you, like we jump to each other's defense and people are like, wait, but you hate that guy. And it's like, well, yes, but that's that's my guy to hate, not yours. You can't. No, this is your nemesis. You find your own. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. You leave my best friend of me alone. Um, but uh, I just I like you too much, I think, for us to actually Aww. be nemesis is nemeses ne- nemeses yeah nemeses. i think what's what's your actual area of study is it history yeah that, that, that that's what my first master's was in yeah your first master's wow yeah wow well the second one's education which is like mostly oh, just yeah. uh, I, it's, it's a professional credential more than anything else honestly you're gonna get that doctor of education <laughs> no yeah well. no 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 my uh my brother joe I needed him for a reference for a job one time. And it was uh, with uh, the county school system, but it wasn't like a teaching job. That's not, it was like Mm -hmm. some kind of central job, you know, so like human resources, something or other. And, uh, and he was like, Oh, make sure you include like my titles on there because it'll be better if you do. But, He's got, he's got uh, his Juris Doctor. He's got his Doctor of Education. He has some kind of doctoral degree from an English law school. Like he, like they, him and my sister lived in England for years while he completed some kind of doctoral degree over there. So, I mean, my man's credentialed. And then, and then I tacked on like his official title as well as like vice provost of education at, you know, fancy. Yeah. University. That, that kind of credentialism does matter in that world mm-hmm. more than it should anyway. Yeah. It's wild. It's wild. It, I think it matters a lot in a lot of places, probably more than it should. Yeah. It's, it's the world we have it now that in a certain weird sense, the master's degree, the new bad tours, it, it shouldn't be what it is. Yeah. So, I love um, your Twitter account because, <laughs> like, you're such a you're such a great like like a meme lord. How do you do this? How do you? How are you so hip with the times? If you find out, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> you're just you. I know. Here, here, here's the thing. So I I was like a lurker for years, like. Mm. I, I just like I I like like I just use Twitter as, as like a news consumption source, and I would I like I would find stuff from Twitter and I would make jokes about it on my Facebook account. And eventually, I had friends go like, "Dude, just like make your own account." Like honestly, at this <laughs> point, like just just rip, rip the band aid off. Just do it. Like okay, fine. <laughs> like, Joe, like when you. When you've had that much experience sort of just sitting on the platform and watching kind of what works and what does it, it does give you a little bit of a sense of like the, the way meme formats work and like the kind of things people mm-hmm. post and that kind of thing. Right. I know uh, Joe pushed me into my first Twitter account and then uh, I got canceled pretty early on. I only had like 85 followers or something and I got canceled. Oh, goodness. And uh, I deleted my account because I was so scared of all the canceling. Um, and then, I don't know, maybe six or eight months later, I made another Twitter account. It's the one I currently have. And I am proud to say I have survived a dozen cancellations at this point. Now, now I just know you mute the threat. That's all you got to do. Oh yeah. The, the, the way to enjoy Twitter, if you want to actively post is to mute and block liberally. Oh yeah, bro. Oh yeah. 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 You, yeah, no, for real. Like, like block the hell out of people, dude. It's. You like you gotta block people and mute as well. Mute's good. Mute's good. You have that like one weird follower that's like like your reply guy all the time, but like it's weird. You mute. Yeah, there are some people who are like just annoying enough that you don't want to see their replies, but but like they're not like super annoying, so you just mute them. Right. And they're not harmless. And, they're they're not harmful. They're right now. There's. 
another end of that spectrum, which is the people who like you dislike so much, they kind of live rent free in your head more than they should. Mm. But if you block them, they'll know that they bother you. So you mute them instead. <laughs> right. right? So, so like somewhere in the middle, you got that block zone. Yeah. 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 Or like if I see You're- a really awful account, just, I, I, I don't know who came up with that post. You might like feature. I'm like, no, I do not like this. Why would you think that I like this? You know? Yeah. And, it's, and so it's, yeah. it's like, okay, block, 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 block. And I will, and I personally, I love, I love the algorithm. Um, because as a Lutheran specifically, maybe you have this experience as an Anglican, but as a Lutheran, I've noticed I confuse I confuse the hell out of algorithms. Um, Cause like I'll, I'll watch all kinds of liturgical content and then like Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, all of them. They're always like, Oh, here's some Roman Catholicism. Are you into that? And it's like, dislike. I no, I, like, I have been getting like Corpus Christi posts like under yeah, the like, 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 yeah, Oh yeah, yeah. 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 The other day I saw Catholic was trending and I was like, that's gotta be just for me. That can't be. <laughs> I saw that too. That's wild. Do you do you think the Pope is gonna resign? Uh, I think I, that's I why mean, it's trending. I, I I mean being very in tune with the mood of the of the College of Cardinals. Uh, as you, yes, as it's your want, as as one happens to be, like, <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I doubt it, but I, uh, I, I do think this, I do think this gives us an opportunity for, to have like, like, like a Benedict Francis Odd Couple movie, like that would be pretty cool. That would be so great. One of my followers suggested that the name of said movie should be Ex Cathedra, which is just so perfect. It works on so many levels. <laughs> I know I'm just I'm just processing in my head like just like the number of layers to that joke that make it work. <laughs> I love okay, so my favorite thing, my favorite thing is when you have to be so deep in memes, like it's like a level 86 meme where you have to know so many different memes and inside jokes and cross references. Like like uh like April 28th, someone just posts a picture of some dry ramen. You know, and that's like a level 82 meme because you got to understand like Justin Timberlake's hair in the 90s and that one song and it's going to be May. The, 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 the other thing that you, that you find is you can't explain Twitter beefs no. to people who aren't on Twitter without sounding like an insane person. You just can't do it. Yeah. <laughs> it just people will just walk away from you slowly going, I, 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 I don't know you. Please, please leave my house. <laughs> please. <laughs> How did you get in here? Right. There's, there's a lot. There's a lot of. Um, I have several friends that are not Christians, but they are Twitter users, uh, and I will often send them threads. And they, if even if they don't get like the theology, they get like the jokes, right? Because they understand yeah. that Twitter, Twitter has a very unique culture. I think. Yes, it does. Are you what culture you? that is? I'm not sure, but <laughs> no, it's certainly not beneficial or edifying in any way. <laughs> uh, are you proud to be a member of that culture? Well, pride's a sin, so. Oh, oh, oh of course. <laughs> and the Anglican Church, as we all know, <laughs> never commits any sins. Oh, of course not. Of course not never happened in our history ever <laughs> nope just don't don't ask um uh, what's your how do you feel uh, as an anglican about divorce but it's like for a king though oh so purely hypothetically <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> just, yeah is, just is, like if it were like 500 years ago and i were a king if, um and I said, I'm just going to go make my own Christianity. Uh, but so, with blackjack and hookers. Okay, so do we want to have a conversation about the King's Great Matter or just about divorce generally? Oh, neither. Honestly, neither. I just <laughs> wanted to take this off. Because I can do both. Oh, yeah, no, I'm good. I would lose that. It's not a contest, but I would still lose. Um, what? What is it? What is your favorite thing about being an Anglican? 
I really, I really lo- like uh, the prayer book. I mean, that's I think that, yeah. that that's central for a lot of people. Um, as I know, it, it was like it was Calvinists who taught me the Bible, but it was Anglicans who really taught me how to pray. Um, mm. Like uh, anybody who's met me will tell you, I cannot do extemporaneous prayer to save my life. It just does 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 not. It just does not go. But yeah. like I like rules and structure. And wouldn't you know? Here's this lovely book that has okay. Here's we're gonna do this in order, and it's and it's, and it's fantastic. Right. Now yeah. like the. Now, the orders for morning and eating prayer are really, like, they're really meant to be used for like, public worship, but there's no reason you can't use that basic structure for personal prayer. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We, um, we, we do the same thing. We have um, CPH actually uh, put out something for free, which is shocking. Um, yeah, that is, that is weird. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it's a brief, brief order for the service of the word. And it's basically that... You can go through it in 30 minutes, 35 minutes, and it's three scripture readings. You got a, an epistle, gospel, and Old Testament. You've got a psalm, so four scripture readings. Um, and then you've got, it's got, you know, the Gloria or whatever, and the various liturgical places. You can put a hymn in there, and it's great. It's great because you, like I said, you can really, you can get through it in 35 minutes and, uh, and it's it's a whole liturgical, you know, order that you can. I mean, you can just do it yourself. It's great. Like, I encourage guys that are like, "Oh, well, how do I, how do I structure family prayer time with my wife and kids?" Well, here you go. Here it is. Here's the book. Here. Yeah, you can go. You can literally download it and print it out for free. I printed mine. I went to a FedEx store and had it printed out. And put in a fancy little binder. It's great. I'll link it in the description. I need to remind myself to link it. I'll forget. I got to do show notes as I go along or I forget these things. Yeah, and of course, then people get into arguments about, oh, which purple should you use? And it's like, oh, boy, here we go. It's, it's just, How many it's do just you have? How, how many? So I have... A copy of the Church of England's prayer book from it's it's, it's a copy of the 1662 book from like the 1850s that somebody gave me as a gift. Um, I've got a copy of the Reformed Episcopal Church's prayer book, and I have like four different copies of the 1928. Two of them in English, one of them in Spanish. The other one is a French translation of the prayer book that was developed by the Episcopal Church for use in Haiti. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the Episcopal Church is just the Anglican Church in America, right? So it was so. It gets muddy here, here we go. for me. Okay, okay. So the 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 Anglican primate in the United States that is formally affiliated with the Church of England is the is the Episcopal Church, or the Protestant Episcopal Church of the United States of America, or the Domestic Conformist of the Society, depending on 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 what name you want to use. Um, okay. The, yeah, the there are a panoply of different other church bodies in the Anglican tradition in the United States. The largest of those being being the ACNA, Anglican Church of North America. The Reformed Episcopal Church was the body that I'm part of as a sub jurisdiction within that body. Uh, but there's there's like a number of other smaller ones. You got like the Anglican Province of America. You got the Anglican Catholic Church, and I I, I think I think a couple of the Anglo Catholic bodies merged recently. I, I I honestly lose track of some of these. So you're in the REC, the Reformed yes. Episcopal Church, which is under yes. the ACNA, the Anglican Church of North America. That is correct. Does the ACNA ordain women? Uh, in some dioceses, do some do not. How does that if work? This is, how can how does that work? I don't. I I don't know. I don't. I, I don't know. Um, and the, in Anglicanism the, the, in general, do y'all do that? I mean, so uh, okay, so. I'm sorry, that was a dumb question. I'm gonna backtrack on that. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Because that was such a dumb way to ask that. So I understand that there are, like Lutherans, like Presbyterians, there are your liberal mainlines, and there are your conservative groups as well. Um, I'm sure there's some Anglicans somewhere that do, and some that don't historically in Anglicanism. Do y'all support things like women's ordination? So women's ordination is, I believe, the norm in the Church of England and in many of the other Anglican communion bodies globally. 
Um, it's there's a, there, there's an there's an in, there's an in my opinion awkward modus vivendi on that issue in ACNA where some has allowed and some don't. When the Episcopal Church started or, or ordaining women, uh, there were a group of there were, there were different groups of Anglicans who broke off and protest against this. So that you you will find the so, so so for example the the RAC does not ordain women. Uh, there are a number number of the smaller Anglo Catholic provinces do not do not ordain women, but the like the the larger quote unquote national Anglican churches by and large do. So I don't if, know that, I don't know that that's, that's nor everywhere in the world though. I think it may depend on the province. I'm not I'm not an expert in Reformation history. I know practically nothing about the event, but if my thinking is correct, didn't the Anglican Church not not one to one but in a way didn't the anglican church just substitute the pontiff for the monarch of england as the head of the church i mean that's a way of looking at it i mean again i'm i'm going i'm i'm not an expert on all like all, all the details of these things i mean You're in in practice it, yeah this is okay this is jokes yeah, yeah, no, it's yeah. Fine. yeah, but yeah, yeah, and the, so like, yeah, it, at, at least in the at least in the Church of England, yes, the the the, the monarch does appoint the bishops. Okay, um, but as far as, far as the management of the, of 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 the church goes, I believe that's normally left to the Archbishop of Canterbury. But again, again, er, early on, Henry VIII definitely had an interest in things being done a certain way. So the, yeah. I, I would I would imagine he was a little more invested in day to day operation than some later monarchs were. But again. I would have to do more reading on that to give you like a firmer, better answer on that. How invested do you think the current monarch is in any of the goings on of the Church of England? I mean, she's known to be personally quite pious, um, but she's also very, very committed to her to role as constitutional monarch. Mm. And so, so there were a lot of changes in the in in the Church of England in like the latter half of the twentieth century that. If she didn't, if she didn't personally approve them, she also didn't really stand in their way. Right. So let's, let's let's put it that way. Not as big of a deal anymore, is what you're saying. The monarch. I'm. I mean, I, I mean, like again, I I would I would have to do like more spe- specific reading on it. But like, if yeah. if the queen was, for example, personally opposed to ordaining women priests, it was something that it was something that like she didn't actively stop. Right. Or at least okay. if she did, at least if she did, I'm I'm unaware of it. Right. That's I don't know the whole. The whole thing is really, it's so fascinating to me, just the whole history of it all and everybody, the the way things panned out. I mean, it's, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. It really is. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a wild and woolly and wonderful thing all at the same time. Hmm. Although there are, you know, there, there are aspects of it one wishes could have gone differently, certainly. Yeah, well, and I mean in everything. Um, I think yeah. even in even in um, some of Luther's own. Um, I hate to call it like the like the Lutheran Reformation, um, but like even in that, there's. I mean, there's certainly things I think we see that you know we wish we could have done a little different. Yeah, there are. Say, but. Luther made some mistakes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, every everybody did. Luther Luther made some mistakes. I think, and I think. Probably later, um, not much later, but like generationally, Lutherans like um, uh, not to dog on on my boy because I think he was an excellent theologian, but um, you know Melanchthon probably in attempting to correct some mistakes made mistakes of his own, and uh, you know on it continues. You know you have guys like like Forty that come in to correct what they see as errors and they swing erroneously the other way. You know, and it's. It's a thin line you gotta tread. It's a thin line. Yeah, and 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 with the Church of England specifically, there's there's the issue that it it, it, it was the English National Church, which means that it's always caught up in mm-hmm. whatever England's domestic politics were. And particularly, right. I mean, it was it was in it was in it was an issue in the mid 16th century. It was an issue in the mid 17th century. It 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 it, 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 it ends up getting embroiled in a number of different things. And you know, in that way, almost the the Episcopalian. Uh, sort of branding in America is is really almost a blessing because it allows you to have 
this Reformation faith um, without necessarily being tied to and known as the Church of England. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? I I, th- I think so. I think a lot of here's here's my here's my reasoning. Let me let me take you from point A to point B on how my sure. mind is pulling this up. But sure. so like Anglicans, like that's the Church of England, right? Right. But like like the Episcopal Church, um, that's a different word. So people might not make like the association. Does that make does that is that making sense? Am sure. I yeah. Of course. I I guess yeah. So I'm. I mean. So they they called it. It was called for a lot of time the Protestant Episcopal Church in, in the United States. Because right. in you know, in in the 18th century, there was this problem where like this was an important it was an important expression of Christian faith in many parts of, of, the, of the United States, but they we weren't England anymore, so you can't have right. the Church of England in the United States because that would that would be weird. So yeah. they had well, so, it's so they, they had to they had to rebrand it the Protestant Episcopal Church. Now this caused a little bit of a holy orders problem because there were no colonial bishops, there was no. Episcopal succession in, in the United States. So there, there right. was a, there's, there, there was a process towards actually getting consecrated bishops in the United States that involves some negotiations and vocal compromises. Yeah. But that, that, I mean, that separation though, um, that exact separation, which is probably brought on by American statehood in, in many ways is itself like, a blessing for the Anglican church in that, look, it can continue here um, in this way under this form and people don't associate it with like the monarch and with England and, and these things, right? Like, so, so Lutheran churches had the same sort of issue right around uh, world war two, you know, where we have the Nazis doing Nazi stuff. And here are all of our churches holding mass in German. And it's like, well, yeah. well, well, you know, so we start holding mass in English and we put American flags in the narthex because it's like, look, we're not, we're Americans, right? Um, yeah, World War One did a lot of that, too. The World Wars did not make it a great time to be culturally German in the United States. No, or really it, uh, any kind of German culturally or, or otherwise anywhere, I think. Yeah, it just was 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 not a great time. Yeah, yeah. Didn't didn't we? I'm not a historian. You are. Didn't we like ban Germany from having armies after the Second World War? Uh, so, yeah. So part 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 of the settlement after World War One was you can have a, a defense ger- force. <laughs> yeah, there's yeah there was a dramatic limitation on um what the, the on like you know the size and the scope of Germany's armed forces after that. That's wild. I think that's wild that another nation, like, could you imagine being an independent nation and some other nation comes in and tells you like, Hey, we all got together and talked about it. And like, you can't have an army like this anymore. <laughs> like, I mean, we kind of still do that. Don't we? We do. Yeah. It's like, wild to me. That's wild. Like, but I mean, at me, the end of the and, day, like, it's, it's like, like North Korea. This is an intervention We're we're all here because we care about you. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. But and I mean, like, but there's always that like subtle. It's amazing to me that even 70 years on, um, there's still that subtle, probably almost 80 years now, huh? That undertone of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. There's still that. Like, I mean, militarily, we're ahead of the world right now. And, you know, we will be for at least another 50 years. And so there's this. You know, yeah, we tell other countries like, hey, you can't do this. But there's that like subtle undertone of like, because we could literally wipe you off the planet. Yeah, we've, we've done it. Yeah. You know, there's uh, and again, not a historian, but it seems to me reading over the histories of these things, like especially the, the A-bomb, that there was a lot of like regret on every side. You know, where it was like right after we dropped it, it was almost like everyone in the whole world was like, holy crap. Yeah, let's let's hope no one does that ever again. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but like that's I mean, but that's a lot of 
that's a lot of any any global powers might today, right? Like Russia, the reason the reason the the war with Russia was so cold, uh, as they say, is because no one wanted it to escalate to that point, right? Like, yeah, you know, I mean, when when you have city destroying, country destroying, civilization ending weapons, that uh, does change calculus a little bit. It does. It does. It does. But like, that's gotta that's gotta be. That's got to be part of the reason why people listen. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, ha- having nuclear weapons does uh, change the way countries behave and the way countries treat countries that have that that, that, that have nuclear weapons. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I guess I, it, I, it's I, a pretty straightforward. I, yeah, I, I mean, if Russia didn't have nuclear weapons, I don't know that they'd be invading Ukraine right now. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We certainly, yeah, we certainly do. And so like, so that's exactly what I'm talking about. Right. Is like, we have such a reluctance to be directly involved in Ukraine because no one wants to, no one wants to be the first people to punt off world war three here. Um, yeah. Memes aside, nobody really wants that. No, no, because world war three would be untold devastation. Right. And, and, and yeah. And I mean, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. Because like, so we tell Germany, like, hey, you can't have – we all got together and talked about it. You can't have, like, a real arm anymore. Um, but it's the same thing with Putin invading uh, the Ukraine. He's like, look, you can't you can't stop me because of the same reason, right? Like, I have these bombs, and if he, if he shoots one, we shoot one, and yeah, on it goes. So – I don't know, dude. I don't know. I'm not going to solve the world's problems. Well, darn. <laughs> now you tell me. Yeah. Sorry to waste your time. <laughs> Sorry, Cranky. I didn't mean. I didn't mean to waste your time. That's. Uh... Well, like I said, I'm on vacation, so. Perfect. Perfect. So, um, this is supposed to be a, th- a theology, I think. So, on. Oh, sh- <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> if you if, it, if you want, on that end of it, um, I find that I have a lot of conversations with Anglicans, and I'm hoping you can shed light on this for me because I don't know what this is. Oh boy, here we go. No, 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 no. I mean, it's good. I I think, um, I think it's good, but I have a lot of conversations with Anglicans where they say, well, they say all this stuff, and I say that's. Lutheran, why don't you just become a Lutheran? And they say, well, I can't be a Lutheran because I don't agree with the Lutheran view of, let's say, the Lord's Supper. We'll pick that one. I don't agree. I like the Anglican view of the Supper. I don't like the Lutheran view of the Supper. And this is an actual conversation I had with a guy once. I said, well, what's the Anglican view of the Supper? And he said, well, we believe in a real sacramental presence in the Eucharist. And I was like, right, that's the Lutheran view. And he goes, no, no, you guys believe in consubstantiation, which is just like transubstantiation, but con. And I was like, no, we don't actually, and we hate that word because it doesn't accurately describe what we believe. So how much, how, how, how much, I feel like our theologies are so much closer than even we realize because like how much talking past each other do you think we're, we're really doing on a lot of these subjects you know it, it, it's funny I'm, I'm remembering a conversation I had with a guy who, who went to our church who said that like a lot of Anglicans start from this position where like, they think they have a lot in common with, with Presbyterians and then they talk to Presbyterians and realize oh wait there's actually some really critical things we, we disagree on mm-hmm. and they think they don't have a lot in common with Lutherans and they talk to Lutherans and go wait a second we, there, there, there's actually more in common than we thought here yeah that's how I feel every time I talk to an Anglican. It really is like about theology. I always think, why aren't you? Why are you Lutheran? So I thought because it's fun to bother Lutherans. I suppose, and I mean, I guess it's really not too big a rub because I'm not too worried like about your salvation, um, and I know you'll be Lutheran in the resurrection, so it's fine. <laughs> 
do you do you think there's a lot of like talking past each other that we don't realize? I th- I think there is to some extent, um, and I I th- I think it's also important not to underestimate the extent to which because you know, when you talk about any kind of religious creed and you talk about people's religious affiliations, these things are often as much sociological as they are theological, mm. right? So like. The reason I knew Lutherans existed growing up wasn't because we went to Lutheran church or because I knew Lutherans. Why did I know Lutherans existed? It's because when we would drive to my grandma's house on weekends sometimes, we would, you know, you would drive like Saturday afternoons and my dad would be playing for a home companion on the radio. And I knew that there were these people called Lutherans who were like vaguely Midwestern people would make past progressive jokes about them. Like that's how I knew Lutherans existed. Like it was this thing for people in the Midwest who had like, German and Scandinavian sounding names, you know, and there's, there's, there, and there's an element of it to that, which is that yeah. to, to assert, there's a lot of people's religious affiliation is to, to, to some extent determined by family and that sort of thing. Now, obviously, obviously there, there are Lutheran converts from cultural backgrounds that are not stereotypically Lutheran. We know this. Mm-hmm. There are people who become Presbyterian who are not Scottish or Scots Irish. There are people who are Roman Catholics from every background imaginable, but it's also not. It's also important not to underestimate that as well, right? And like, I like, I, I think as I, I, I know you, you, you and C.D. Henry were talking about this when when he was on about like you know there's this in this migration of Southern Baptists into the ACNA for re- reasons that I think are interesting and perhaps somewhat muddled, but I think it's not. I think it's important not to underestimate the fact. That the, the the Anglican churches enjoy a cult, you know, a cultural capital of being sort of the broad church of sort of middle middle and upper class English speaking people in the U.S. Mm. It's an it, it, it's and I I do think there is sort of sort of like like a social acceptability element to it. Yeah, you know there there's and not not that being Lutheran is socially unacceptable by by, by any means, but yeah it it's it has been stamped as okay this is the Nord Church. Right, for better or for worse, in, you know, in 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 much the same way that being a convert into certain kinds of Southern Baptist churches can be difficult if you're not from a certain cultural background, and these are and these are the various things that do in the long run get in the way of Christian unity. Unfortunately, hmm. like if what? I mean, like if, if you read if you read histories of American religion about the 19th century. If you read the ones that treat religion primarily as a sociological phenomenon, it's those books are mostly about Baptists and Methodists. Mm. If you read the ones that are mostly about like intellectual life and theology, you get the impression everybody is like Presbyterian or Congregationalist, mm. because those those were a lot of the guys who were like writing and publishing. What? What theological differences do we have, do you think? Like, what, in your mind, what are the biggest theological distinctions you would draw between Anglicans and Lutherans? I mean, I do think the Lord's Supper is, like, one, one of the big ones, precisely because Anglicans, for the sake of themselves, cannot make up their minds about what it is. I mean, <laughs> that's just a fact. Um, I, look, you know, we, you know, we have the homilies, we have three nine articles, we have, we, we have the prayer book. But there, I mean, you'll you will find people who consider themselves Anglicans who believe in transubstantiation, despite the fact that, despite the fact that that was specifically abjured in three articles. Um, you'll find I've met Angl- Anglicans who are, who are memorialists. Um, the Eucharistic theology that's outlined in the three articles is, I mean, you can make a good argument that it's really receptionist in the way that it approaches uh, that it, 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 it approaches the Eucharist in practice. You find a lot of people whose view of it is, is is in fact very Lutheran, but the but the fact that at a, at a personal individual level, what you know, whatever the canons of a particular church say, the fact that I think a, a lot of individual Anglicans can't make up their minds as to what that actually means, I think I think is a problem. So I, you know, I think you know if if you're you know if if the Lutherans and the Anglicans sat and said and said as uh, uh, okay, we're we're we're, we're going to hash this out. That that's gonna be. I I I think a Lutheran could not unreasonably say, "Hey, look, you guys have this statement about the Eucharist in your in your articles, which reads very reformed, but a lot of your people, when you talk to them individually, sound very Lutheran, and some of them sound very Zwinglian. What's going on here? Like that, like that's gonna be part of it. Yeah. Um, I do think I do think another issue there is 
Anglicans can be a little more particular about the specifics of Holy Orders or Lutherans can, um, mm. which, and, 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 and again, you know, different Anglican commentators have been on different sides of whether or not Lutherans have valid orders. Huh. Like, like that's a, like, like that's another thing that would, that, 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 would, that would come up as well. That's fascinating. Like if, yeah. If you're like, if, if you're like deeply wedded to the idea of, well, you have to receive orders from Bishop and Apostolic Succession, which is, an, you know, that might cause a problem for the status of some, some Lutheran orders. But there's, there have been, there have been Anglican commentators who have said, well, okay, so we have these German churches on the continent and they have these superintendents who, while they don't call themselves bishops, they, in, for every, in every way that matters, they carry out the functions of a bishop. So why are we going to say they don't have bishops? Like there are some people who've, who've taken that position. Right. Um, I would say that it's wild that you have Anglicans that have no idea what they believe or they believe one, one guy could be believing the Zwinglian view that it's a memorial meal and nothing else, just bread and wine sitting right next to a guy who believes transubstantiation on the same pew with a guy who believes a more Lutheran view to the right of them. And all three of them could go up and take communion together. And I was going to comment on like how wild that is. Uh, but I realized like how many of our own people in Lutheran churches like actually know even what they believe. Like here's the thing the church teaches, but you know, what you believe um, and, and, and it's such a, we do such a, I think just a, a terrible job of teaching. I don't know. Oh, I see. And, and this is something I, I noticed a while ago is I, I, I noticed a lot of Lutherans on Twitter who are like, you know, they're, they're very proud of the fact that, you know, their, their Lutheran church body fences the table. You know, you know, we have our right. specific belief about the Lord's Supper, and we don't let you, in, you know, we don't let you commune, you know, unless you're, you know, in, in our communion. And then I know that these are the same people who complain about other Lutheran churches and their denomination who don't fence the table. And I went, yeah. okay, so do, does that uniformity exist or does it not? And I, right. you know, and I, I, th I think you're going to find that problem at different scales in pretty much any ecclesial body you, you can name. It's so yeah. it exists in the, you know, if it exists in the Roman Catholic Church, it exists among Presbyterians. Like it, mm -hmm. it, it exists pretty much everywhere. But I, I think it that level of disunity, I think, afflicts different communities in different ways. I'm very I'm teaching a dogmatics class in my own church. Um, and it's been it's been very fruitful so far. We have been trying to get through um, Edward Kaler's summary of Christian doctrine uh, for the last year, and we've we've got maybe halfway through because uh, we don't get very far before before we have good discussions about it. Oh yeah, but I'm I'm very very excited to get to the end times, um, just so that we can bring up the whole rapture left behind thing, um, and just point out that we don't actually believe that um, bit. That's that was a Tim LaHaye book. You know, and uh, I'm very, very excited to see the reactions in there, you know, because I mean, it's been wild so far. It's been a good time. Yeah, I, I, I have to wonder if that obsession with the specifics of eschatology is a uniquely American thing or I think it is. Yeah, because there's like, here's the thing, like it when you study 19th century American history, which is what I did when I was in grad school you really can't study it without learning with Christian eschatology. It just doesn't work. Like it, hmm. it just, it, it, it sits so close to people's minds about what they're doing That's and so it's weird. second and third order effects that are like so important. Like, like, like you, you can't get a full understanding of that period without understanding the basics. Yeah. It's so wild. It's, um, yeah, yeah. It's, it's almost, it's almost like the lens through which, um, at least for me growing up, it was the lens through which everything else was, was framed, was this sort of eschatological, you don't want to be in the tribulation kind of idea. It was like the, the foundation of our theology, which is yeah. weird. Yeah. And like the church I was raised in, just, you shouldn't talk about it. Like just, I, I, I don't think anybody <laughs> ever mentioned it. Right. That's, that's wild. I, uh. Yeah, so I guess I get my 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 dunk 
my dunk on Anglicans every time is that you can you can believe anything and still be an Anglican. Um, but I mean that's really that's true of like you said any ecclesial body you're gonna because you can I mean you can teach you can teach whatever you want and teach it everywhere and consistently if you want. But at the end of the day, like what somebody really thinks deep down, you know, I guess, I guess the key is, can someone openly confess transubstantiation and still commune? I mean, in some Anglican church bodies, you probably could, honestly. In some Lutheran Um, church bodies, you probably could. Yeah. But I, I, it, it, it also comes down to sort of, you know, when, when we say, church teaching, what do we actually mean, right? Because mm. when we, I think, I think particularly like at an intellectual academic level, when we talk about church teaching, we treat it like it's this thing that kind of exists in that like platonic realm that we can, and we can access it by scouring through everything that like Augustine and Chrysostom wrote and we read the Bible. Right. And eventually and if we read it properly, then it will become clear. And in a certain sense, it is that, but but like you can, so teaching on the one hand, it like is a noun, but it's also a verb. And what actual clergy are saying and doing is a form of teaching. So if, right. you know, if, 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 if you've got a priest or if you've, 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 you've got a pastor in like a remote jungle somewhere and he's the only pastor for a thousand miles in any direction, and that guy is teaching memorialism, just as an example, well, in that area, that's what the church is teaching. Right. Like that, right. And, and now that's a problem. Yeah. Like, I think that's a problem because I, as I, I don't think memorialism is, 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 is the best way to approach the Eucharist, especially at, like at, an, at an operational level. But for the people who are encountering the gospel from that minister, that is what the church is teaching them. Hmm. And, and like, a, a, like a lot of people believe erroneous things because that's what they've been taught. That is what right. the church taught them. Yeah. Yeah. It, it goes back to an earlier discussion I had on this podcast that – a lot of times people go, they go to the PCA church or they go to the ELCA church or they go to the Baptist church or they go to whatever the Methodist church, the Episcopal church. It doesn't matter. They go to the church, not because they're Presbyterians or Methodist or Episcopalian or Baptists or whatever. They go to the church because it's the one in town. Yeah. Right. Like it's the, it's yeah. just, it's the only church nearby so that's the one we go to why are we methodist dad because there's a methodist church five miles from the farm and for a lot of people that's good enough yeah and honestly if i'm being completely frank i think like for day-to-day people like for general christian laity i i agree i think it's enough i think that's like like i (laughs) I, I do think that the uh, the ready availability of information on the internet has not been entirely good for Christians for a number of reasons. One of them is that it's created this expectation on the part of certain people that every lay Christian is going to be this fully formed theologian who yeah. can answer complicated questions about it. It's, it's like, no, mo- most people can't do that. That has, like, I mean, a lot much- of pastors, a lot of pastors can't even. Yeah, it. It, it's, it, it's 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 like I I, I remember when I, when I was a Presbyterian, we, we we were reading one of those books that like small groups read when you're in the foreign world. And a purpose driven <laughs> life. Not that one, but <laughs> a little more serious than that. And at one point, the author straight up says that it's a sin not to read the Bible every day. Wow. And I'm going like, OK, so let's go back to like the 11th century. Right. When a large proportion of Christian laity can't even read. Mm-hmm. And maybe the nearest parish church, like, is like several miles from them. So, like, maybe if they can get to Mass on a Sunday, they can they can hear Scripture once a week. And it may not even be in the vernacular, depending on where they are. Right. You know. Yeah. Okay, so, so, so you can make a claim that, okay, well, now that scripture is available in virtually every vernacular language on the, on the planet, which was all the large ones that, that, that like that creates an expectation that you should be able to do that. Like, okay. You can make that claim as a normative claim that everybody must on penalty of sin do something. I don't, 
I, I'm, not, I'm not really sure that's a, that, that, that's a claim we should be making so stridently. It's um, it's like the um, the one of the we don't know where the phrase comes from, truly, but one of the theories that the phrase hocus pocus for general magic comes from the Latin mass because the priest elevates the host and he says hoc est corpus meum. Yeah, uh, I've I've heard the same story. I don't know if it's true right. or not. But. Yeah, no, we don't know if it's true or not. But the idea is that you have some farmer who you're right has to walk miles to the nearest church. He can't read or whatever. And he's trying to explain theology to his kids. And he says, well, the priest lifts up the bread and he says, hocus pocus. And it's Jesus, you know, and it's, it's, no, a, I don't know, like it, it good enough. Like, I don't know for me, I think that's, I think, I think God understands. You and know, like, you, you, you read like some, some of the accounts about some of the, some of these, these medieval churches where you'd have, priests who knew often just enough Latin to be able to say mass. Right. And, you know, you know, people would show up and no, I was, I was reading this book about medieval Spain and the guys telling the story of how you, we have, we have accounts of, you know, guys would just kind of loiter around outside the church. They would go in with the consecration of the elements. They would see the host lifted up and they go, okay, did our thing. And then they would leave. Right. Because for many people, simply seeing the Eucharistic host elevated was their experience of that sacrament. For most of the year, yeah, wild. Like it's not that they never received; it was just not as calm as, as as it is today. Yeah, it's um, I don't know, dude. I, I, I so talking about um talking about how m the internet has made us expect most laity to be some kind of hyper educated theologian, um, and like pastors, even you you mentioned earlier that like we often view like the Bible and theology as this sort of platonic thing that we can access and reach into and know and understand. And we, we so often forget that two different people will read a, a Bible passage to from the same tradition two let's say two different yeah, yeah. Lutherans, two different Lutherans. They went to the same Lutheran high school, the same Lutheran college. They're at the same Lutheran seminary. They will read the same biblical passage and the same commentary from the same church father and still walk away with yeah. completely different ideas yeah. about what what it is they just read and understood, you know. And it's, I don't know, man, like this, I, I don't want to say theology is subjective because it's not, but there is certainly a personal element to it that you... I don't know. I think people don't understand on the internet that there's, there's such a, there's such a personal, I was, a, so I was talking to an ELCA pastor and on this show. And I realized that we have major differences theologically, but at the end of the day, the thing we tell the widowed woman crying in the, it's the same. It's the same thing. Yeah. You know, like it's, there's, I don't know, there's a lot of things like that in both, that goes both ways, you know, I don't know. There's a whole personal element to theology that. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Cranky. Yes. How can I, Remy. How, how can I be? How can I be more of a Twitter meme lord? I'm, I want to be like you. How can I be? <laughs> Words no one has ever said in their life ever until now. Okay. <laughs> Not to me anyway. <laughs> hmm. The best way I can think of to answer this question is, okay, Make a joke that you think is funny. Okay. And the chance that you will find someone on Twitter who also, th also think that's funny within your own audience is pretty good. Okay. All right. That's fair. Okay. Because, like, half the stuff I post is stuff that I know, <clears throat> excuse me, that I know, like, me and, like, five other people actually think is funny. <laughs> <clears throat> and then there will be, like, a dozen other people who are like, I know that's a joke, 
and I'm going to hit the like button anyway because I, wa- I want to show that I understand there's a joke going on here. But do they? Hmm. Who's to say? Who's how, to say? How often, how often do you think so? How often do you think you make a joke on Twitter that, okay, so I don't know if this happens to anybody else. This happens to me a ton where I get a joke, but I don't understand the joke. Or maybe it's the other way around. I understand like the joke that they're making, but I don't get the joke specifically. See, at a very meta level, I both do and do not understand what you're saying. Right, because it's like it's like, oh yeah, I get the joke that you're making. It's like a Christological joke about this heresy, and I understand that, but I absolutely do not know who Saint Borgimo the the quintupled yeah. turtle man was, you know, and it's, so it's, yeah. it's like, this is a niche joke that I, I, I understand, but I don't get. It, it's like, I, I was watching this, it's like 10 years ago. I was watching this German movie called goodbye Lenin. And like parts of it are funny. Like it's actually, they're funny, but there's the, when you, when you're when I don't speak German, so I have to watch the English subtitles. And there are moments you're going, that's clearly a joke. And if you're German, this must be hilarious. <laughs> but the German sense of humor to the extent that it exists is lost on me. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's, um, I think, okay. So I think, I think you nailed it when you said conceptually, I understand this is a joke. Right, like, yes. <laughs> like I get, I get the joke. I see here's the punchline and I understand the setup, but like, I don't get, if you, I don't get, if you the had joke. to explain, if you had to, to like dissect the joke and explain why it's funny, you'd be like, oh, look, you're as good as mine, pal. <laughs> <laughs> That's the key to Twitter humor is like esoteric. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. Cranky, thank you so much for being on here today, man. I had a fun time talking to you. Yeah, sure. We had no no set topic, and I think we did a really good job of meandering through a bunch of random things. You know, you know, we you know, we checked the Henry the Eighth box, which is good. Yep, yep. So we we, we at least brought, yeah, we we at least we, we we at least brought him up. I called you to repent and, of your Anglicanism. Yeah, That's good. yeah, yeah, yeah. And like because you know, ev- like ev- every Anglican gets the Henry the Eighth question at least once, and we all have an answer for it. It's like it's what's your fantastic. answer? So we the answer is your answer. What's your answer? Oh yeah, yeah, sure. So Henry the Eighth did not found the Church of England. Mm. So the Jesus you know, like, Christ. You know, Okay, yeah. So that's um, yeah, so, so like the the meme answer to this, the meme answer is that Joseph of Arimathea brought a very young Jesus of Nazareth to Britain when he was a boy, and Jesus personally instituted the Church of England when he was there. That's the meme answer. <laughs> the 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 actual answer is that is that the Church of England has existed ever since there were Christians in England. Right. Okay. And that and that the separation of the English Church under Henry is a juridical matter, and doesn't represent like an like an ontological break. Gotcha. Okay, so and that's that, that's, that's how the, that's how we view Lutheranism then. Yeah, and 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 that's like entirely independent of whether or not Henry VIII was a terrible person, which he was. Right. Okay. So uh, for us, for us Lutherans on the Lutheran end, we get the same question, but it's uh, did you know Luther wrote a book called "On the Jews and Their Lies"? And okay, that's, okay, that's okay, where it's we're that at. One. Okay, it's that one. There's uh, my personal favorite is that. Um, Luther started the Reformation so he, so he could like have a relationship with nuns. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. That, that, that's like, that, that's another favorite. And, and then also uh, Luther removed books from the Bible. That's the other one. Yeah, which, which is know, that, that, which is funny because like Catholics added books to the Bible. Luther well, didn't see, remove any. And that, that that one is like a bat signal for Don Stein. Like you, you <laughs> like there, he will he will just <laughs> jump on top of it. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> You're like, did someone call? <laughs> I am here uh, to destroy the bad take. <laughs> I was just texting him last night. I need to. I need to subtweet about about Luther removing books from the Bible and see if I can encourage him to show up. <laughs> that's great. That's that, that's Don. how we that, that that's how we know Don's been kidnapped is when he starts tweeting about, about how about how Luther about how Luther took <laughs> books from the Bible. That's how we'll know. 
Uh, he's such a great guy. I am guy. tweeting this voluntarily. I am in no danger. I am healthy. James am is an epistle of straw. Yeah. Yeah, and again, and again, our response is pretty similar. Our response is pretty similar. When someone comes up and they say Luther was an anti-Semite, I mean, you know, we can we can talk about Luther railing against religious Judaism versus ethnic Judaism or whatever that people want to do. But I mean, at the end of the day, the, the real answer is, well, we don't follow Martin Luther. Right. So in fact, he, I don't even think he wrote most of our confessions. I think most of the actual book of Concord was written by like other people. So, I mean, someone can fact check me on that. I'm probably wrong, but it just, at the end of the day, like we don't canonize his works. So Man, it doesn't really matter what he wrote, you know. Yeah, if if if, if there are monarchs that Anglicans obsess over, it's normally like Edward the Sixth, Elizabeth the First, or, or Charles the First. Okay, it's hard to find a good monarch. Like, really, it's, monarchs are usually terrible. They were all they were all politicians in their own way. Yeah, I mean, but I mean, even going all the way back, like biblically. You know, like the having a truly benevolent ruler who actually cares about the people, generally rare, historically speaking. Oh, it's like 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 when when the Hebrews go to Samuel and say, "Hey, we 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 really we really like a king," and Samuel's like, "Okay, come on." It's like, <laughs> "I'll do it, but you're gonna regret it." <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Just, and God, I want you to know what you're asking for. <laughs> God's over here, like, "Hey, come on, I'm here." I've been doing, been doing the thing this whole time, you know. But everyone did what was right in their own eyes, which they're doing today, and it's it's exciting times. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, "You know what? I'm gonna be the bad guy today." <laughs> and yet, and yet, everybody is so good at it. I know. <laughs> uh, that's awesome, Cranky. You want to? I come just back keep sometime? sinning, man. Do you, Do you want to come back sometime onto the show? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Great. Perfect. Um, I will have, I will put your Twitter link in the show notes along with, uh, the other thing I mentioned earlier and, and okay, probably okay. a book, a book of common prayers. Is there anything else I can do for you? Anything we can pray for? I don't for? think so. Uh, as far as praying for things, uh, I need to find housing. Okay. Uh, I, I think yeah, it's, I don't, people, I don't, I don't, I don't I, I know people have probably heard a couple of cars in the background. What you don't know, because I don't actually show the video, is that Cranky is actually filming this um, uh, under an overpass. <laughs> um, he is currently homeless, so we'll definitely keep like, that I, in prayer. Yeah, and 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 just like for my general like work situation. <laughs>